Okay. Um, okay. To, well, to introduce myself, I'm a, I'm a wildlife photographer and I'm also, um, we've already seen this one. See you again. I'm also, uh, I'm also an engineer. So in my day, in my day job, I work part-time as an engineer, but, um, during my night job, um, I started out just by, um, like I said, being attacked by a goshawk. Um, I, we had gone to search out her nest. So, um, that was, we knew that she could be aggressive near the nest. We just stumbled onto the nest way more quickly than we expected to. But just, um, just that experience just really had me curious. And so I started, uh, I started exploring our, our local wild areas, um, and, uh, found out about wood ducks and how beautiful they are. And I also found out early that they're very difficult to get close to. So I did a lot of, a lot of research. I've amassed quite a few um, books about wood ducks and then um, invested in some camouflage. And, and I did manage to get photographs of wood ducks. But during that process, I also, um, and uh, in all, all their life phases, but also all of the wetland land wildlife, just when you become invisible in the, in the woods, everything comes out like the bobcat was actually just walking through uh, Brick Pond, my local wetland, uh, one day. But all the rest of it is sitting in a blind, just being invisible, and just I just fell in love with the wetland ecosystem, and so I wanted to start uh, working to protect that. So I do a lot of volunteer work. I'm a board member at Waterman's uh, Conservation Education Center here, and we do a lot of uh, what I call the Natural History Through the Lens program because. Um, just by being a photographer, I became a naturalist because I spent so much time in the woods and just learning everything that I could. Um, so I've learned a lot through my own photography. I go back and I come back home and I, um, I study the behaviors that I, I witnessed and I do more research. Um, and so I've spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time sitting in blinds, but, um, but yeah, so I'm trying to get other people interested, um, in learning and exploring through their own lens because everybody has a camera now even if it's just on their cell phone and everybody's taking photos so it's just a way to try to draw them into paying more attention to their surroundings and hopefully wanting to protect their surroundings just because when you fall in love with something you want to help it so um, I've done a lot of travel then uh, you know Africa Florida Minnesota Alaska but more recently, I've been focusing on my own backyard ecosystem, and um, I bought a half, a half acre above me, and I'm working hard to uh, draw to provide that uh, provide a little um, a little uh, safe area for the local wildlife. Like the, we have foxes in our neighborhood and deer, and you know your typical squirrels and a lot of birds. So this is just some pictures that I've taken in the last year in my backyard. Um, I'm in a little battle with one of my neighbors right now who would prefer that I mow it all down. So, <laughs> but I'm gonna, um, I, I'm, I'm planning to maybe put out some interpretive signs or something so that it can explain um, what I'm trying to do here. Um, and then I've also been um, working with a, a local friend who um, monarch conservation. She she raises them and release, released over 800. I have a slide about that later on. But this is just all the type of things that I'm working on these days. Um, so just a little introduction to me and how I spend my time. But you came to hear about my, my adventures. <laughs> these two specific adventures. So um, I'm going to start out with the desert and what I call the hunt for horns. In 2013, uh, we began a quest to try to try to locate bighorn rams. We just wanted to see these amazing creatures that could sport these 30 pound head headgear. Um, and we started out in 2013, we started out, uh, we planned a trip to Yellowstone National Park, and 
That was during, that just happened to occur the week of the, um, the shutdown in, in the, that year. So we couldn't go to Yellowstone. We had to regroup and figure out a new location. And a friend of ours told us about um, this whiskey based basin wildlife habitat area. So, and if you Google it, you see that some of the top images are bighorn, um, mature bighorn rams. Like you can see some large groups here. So we thought, oh great, no problem. Plus like four weeks before we were gonna go here, a friend of ours posted this photo on Facebook and she was sitting uh, painting right next to these three beautiful rams. So we thought, oh, no problem. We'll find them the first time we go. But um, first of all, I showed this picture in the, in the intro slide, but um, if you look, bighorn rams have um, a white, a big white spot on their bums. So that's kind of the best thing to look for is the white that kind of stands out. Otherwise, they really blend right in. But you can see in the landscape, like there's white all over the place in rocks. So they're, they're it, you know, we were scouring the, the roadside and, and in the car and then, you know, walking around. And all we saw were every time, like we'd be driving down the road and be like, oh, I see something. And, and then we'd get our binoculars out. No, it's just a rock. And that went, we went back and forth on that several times. That particular visit, we didn't see anything. We saw some scat in one location and it may have, and we did see, um, we did see these beautiful mule deer. It was, it was uh, October time frame, but we didn't see any bighorn rams, ewes, lambs, nothing. The next year we, made the same plan, but we finally got to go to Yellowstone. This is Lamar, the Lamar Valley, my favorite uh, Soda Butte Creek, I believe. It's my favorite location, location in Yellowstone. And, uh, oh, yep. And then that year we, we got to see my, our first mountain goat. So there was a white spot that actually turned out to be something, not a bighorn ram. <laughs> But we did actually, so we didn't see anything in Yellowstone. We went back to Whiskey Basin and we did find a small group of uh, ewes and lambs. So we were getting closer, but that year we still didn't see a single ram. <laughs> Next year, same plan. We actually saw a young bighorn ram. Um, he's about four years old, but you can see um, his horns don't really, they're not very mature. So. We were excited, but it wasn't quite what we were after. Um, but we did get to see some cool activity. Um, they can, with their with their uh, cloven hooves, their small cloven hooves, they can maneuver uh, um, some pretty precarious surfaces. So this is a this is a a bunch of images together to uh, show him climbing up the mountain is pretty amazing. So um, anyway, we, we, we still wanted more and I think three years passed. Oh, there, uh, there were some, uh, some lambs chasing each other across the rocks. In 2019, no, uh, yeah, two, 2019, yeah, we had, uh, I had a seminar in Las Vegas. And John went with me and he said, Hemingway Park in Nevada. You, you can always find bighorn rams there. If, again, you Google images and all the, all the top images, this is like the first search, all the top images have bighorns all over the place. We would have preferred a more natural area, but, excuse me, but, um, but we just wanted to find some. So we went to Hemingway Park and it was beautiful, but we didn't find a single bighorn, not even a you or lamb, a uh, ram, a you or lamb, sorry. So we went off to Vegas. And then a friend told us about um, Valley of Fire National Park. Uh, I was in a, I was in a, an editorial review and I just managed, I just mentioned it offhand. I said, you know, we had this quest, this multi-year quest for bighorn rams. And they said, oh, 
Valley of Fire State Park, they're all over the place. Well, you Google Valley of Fire State Park, and the top images, there's not a single, you know, big horn. So we were skeptical. We thought, no way. <laughs> but, well, we had nothing to lose. So we went there, and it, the, the landscape is spectacular. And they were all over the place. <laughs> so we finally got to see our bighorn rams. And uh, um, bighorn rams, I don't know if, if any of you have been there. I guess I should have asked that before before I started. But bighorn rams spend their time in gender specific groups. And this is a large group of males. And there's always, there's always a fight for dominance with bighorn rams. And the where he who he who has the biggest horns uh, t typically wins the battles, and typically it, the more more mature ones will have the larger horns. Um, also, e the younger the younger rams will spend more time together, and then the more mature ones will spend time together. So just to illustrate to you just how difficult it is to find uh, a bighorn rams, it looks like, uh, this could look like just any other scenery, like it just looks like rocks. But there's one, oh, there, there's, there's one, actually there's more than one. So there can just be zero rams and then Here's a little. So you can go, I call it clown rock because I felt like it was like a clown car and they're just, all these clowns are coming out of this car. <laughs> but I mean, you can go from nothing to, you know, seven, seven rams in one area. So the, it can be very difficult to see them, to find them. But uh, they, they spend a lot of their time, they forage for Let's see, rams, uh, rams forage, I believe. Yeah, they're not really picky. Uh, they'll, they'll eat anything. Um, and they're, but they like to find the more green vegetation, I think, and they get their, they get their water through their vegetation. So they have, um, sorry, I have notes. They have ruminant stomachs, which is the four chambered stomachs, and they'll eat for a long period of time, and then they'll go and rest and then ruminate. They'll be pulling their food back up and then chewing it more. Um, again, there's always a battle for dominance. In this case, the one in the back is trying to show his dominance just by, by putting his chin on the back of this one. And I just, uh, I just liked the scene in this one. They're just so, they're just so majestic looking and proud. Um, but they're very rarely, you can barely, very rarely see them without multiple, um, without groups. They're, they're rarely alone. And again, the one in the back is establishing dominance by rearing up on the one in the front, in the middle. Um, you can see on this one, the horns are split on the ends because, uh, they, they ram, they, they're, their namesake behavior, behavior of ramming, um, and they use their ram, their horns as tools, as weapons rather. And this is just another um, very mature one. You can see you can see just how thick it's grown. Unlike uh, unlike deer, they they keep their horns their whole lives, and you can see the marbling. Uh, of the fur pattern that's basically a cowlick in the fur. And here, here, this would have been uh, battered from another, another horn of another ram. So they're always in battle. 
a tough life. And this is just a, a portrait of a just a really mature, mature ram. Um, bighorn sheep have a cycle of cyclovergence. They're able to um, move their pupils separately. They have eyes wide on their heads. And when they, when they, if you look at this one, his eyes are, he's looking out and his pupils are vertical. And as, as they duck down to eat, they can still see a vertical view of the horizon. So, or uh, sorry, a horizontal view of the horizon. Um, that allows them, and then, and then with the eyes wide and kind of separated like the way that they are, they have a, about a, a very long expansive view of the horizon. It's interesting to see how prey animals, uh, you know, that are kind of, that are hunted by the apex predators, it's interesting to see how they've evolved to protect themselves. When they're looking, when they're going to uh, bed down in a location to ruminate, they will often scrape rocks away. So this is this is a this is a good sign that they've been around because they've scraped away a lot of the rocks. And here's another another illustration of just how this guy's walking down a very narrow rim here. no problem. And this is a younger group. You can see that their horns haven't come all the way around yet. And again, illustrating that they stay kind of within their age group. And they're always, they're always ramming. Always that testra. Even during, during mating season, when they're, they're in the rut, um, the battles are very intense. When we were there, it was just just establishing dominance. There was no major, major fighting. I'd like to see them during the rut sometime. So it's interesting to see how they establish their dominance and really the, this is this the others are just kind of hanging out so there's no tension here it's just almost play and then the again gender specific or age specific groups the ewes and lambs kind of tend to stay together then the, the ewes take care of the lambs um they'll um breastfeed when they're younger and I was taking this picture and my boyfriend took a picture of me photographing them. And I think it's kind of interesting to see the perspective because he's shooting down and you can see the red behind them and I'm shooting up and you can see the sky and it looks like a completely different location almost. But this is actually this right here. Oh, sorry. That's just this right here. Out in Valley Fire State Park, or anywhere really in the western states, you'll always hear the the crowing of, or the call of the raven. Um, so there are there are other, there are other other forms of wildlife too. Um, the uh, antelope squirrel, which is the uh, I can't I've got it right here. White, sorry, a white-tailed antelope squirrel. They're teeny tiny. They're about chipmunk size. Uh, and so you just check low on the rocks and you'll usually find them skidding, skittering around. And if you look in the crevices, you can see some desert cottontails, which repurpose um, hollows in caves and in rocks. And lizards, and I am not a lizard expert. I did not take the time to identify the species. The 
the rock formations were formed by uh, by dunes and shifting sands uh, and uh, fault lines. And it's just really amazing. It almost looks like they've extruded. This is through a, an extrusion, extrusion machine or something, but it just, uh, and there's also the, the wearing over time. It's, it's very fragile rock. Uh, and <clears throat> one thing we were driving, excuse me, as we were driving through, we came upon this grave site, which we thought was very interesting. Um, <coughs> excuse me, John J. Clark uh, had been, after, after war, I mean, he fought in the war and he was honorably discharged and he was traveling through the desert here. And uh, he was found later like dead underneath his, his wagon. I'd like to know personally what happened to his horse because they don't talk about his horse here. <laughs> but I guess there was no water. And if you, if, you, if you look around, there's just not a lot of water. And this was mid-June, so it had to be even worse. Um, I took this right below the grave, and this was February, and there's this little trickle. But I imagine it was to show the irony, but I guess, I guess in February, there would be a little more water. So you can understand how he, he dehydrated. As, uh, and then also that night as we were leaving, we just were greeted by a couple of yous as we left. Showing their beautiful um, musculature. Um, these are desert bighorn rants. There are actually three subspecies of, of uh, sheep, sorry, desert bighorn sheep, bighorn sheep, which is the Nevada, Sierra Nevada, um, the Rocky Mountain bighorns. The Rocky Mountains are the ones that you're going to see more in Colorado and in northern Yellowstone where we were looking for them previously. Um, the desert bighorn sheep are much more lean and more muscular and I actually think they're a little more beautiful. The, 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 the Rocky Mountain bighorns you know almost look like barrels because they have all that extra fat because it's much colder where they are. So another female, and you can really see their uh, rectangularly shaped pupils in this one. And here's just a little bit of a uh, little scene just to show them milling about. It's just a little, little bit. And I don't know if we should ask questions on this one first before we move on or do the whole thing at the end. Uh, Christy, what's your... Uh, which would you prefer? Whichever. Does anyone have any questions about the... I don't even know how to... I can't see everybody. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, does anybody have any questions about uh, this part of the presentation? You can either unmute yourself or write it in the chat box. Yes. I was wondering what kind of lenses you use to get those close-ups. Um, so for, for this trip, I, I had a 1 to 400 millimeter zoom lens, and then um, I had that 1.4x teleconverter on the, the closer-up ones, and I was using a full-frame camera. So I'm shooting with Canon. I don't know. If, are you a photographer? Yes. Yes, and a, a freelance journalist. Oh, okay. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, 
yeah, so for this, you could get really close to them. They're not too spooked by people. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the, a lot of my subjects, like the, the wood ducks, you, you need as much land as is possible, which um, I've, I've either used a 500 or a 600 for, for those. And the right. beach scenes you're going to see in the next presentation are primarily the five or 600. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, I have a question. There's a little black spot under their eye. What is that? Is that help reflection? I, be I believe that is the case. It's like football players do with their eyes. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, I think it's sun, is it sun's glare? Mm -hmm. And if I, I'll actually look that up and if I answered that incorrectly, I'll, I'll follow up with that. It looked like it was really hard, like um, on some of the close-ups, it looked Let's see. really like a disc or something. Yeah, the males. That was really interesting about, I've always wondered about goats, why their eyes were that shape so they could see the horizon. Oh yeah, yeah, the, nature is just, the more and more I get out there, I just, it's remarkable. Just every single species has its own unique uh, tendencies and capabilities, and it's all due to having evolved as a prey or a predator and to meet their needs. Any any further questions about the rams, the sheep? Their nose or, is a perfect heart. I'm, I'm sorry? It's, it's just a silly observation. Their nose, some of their nose is made a perfect heart. Oh, right? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, actually this last one, I think, shows it. Yeah. Yeah. She's got a beautiful heart. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on and if you think of another question you can always ask it at the end. So desert to shore in pursuit of peeps. <laughs> so as long as I've uh, actually, let's, well, let's start here. Um, I think this was 2012. I was standing on the shore of the Susquehanna overlooking, there was a, an eagle's nest across the water from me. And I was trying to get closer looks and I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I looked down in the ground and I saw this tiny little bird flitting about at the edge of the shore. And I had no idea what it was, but I took a photo of it and I later on discovered that this is a spotted, um, spotted sandpiper, excuse me. And I just fell in love with it. it. It's just really fun to watch them with bobbing their tails and, and just hunting along the shore for marine invertebrates. And I became fascinated by shorebirds. And I started seeing images of the the tiny little peeps, I call them peeps, which is the um, shorebird babies, because when when you see uh, songbirds, when songbirds fledge the nest, they're already full grown, so they're, and they're not really that cute when they're growing up because they, uh, they're they born without feathers. So, but I saw pictures of shorebirds and they, they just look adorable. So I went on this long quest, <laughs> again, to find peeps. And I was, I, I just happened to be taking a trip out to Alaska in July of 2016, and I thought, oh, well, it's going to be nesting season, so maybe I'll get to see something interesting there. And so this occurred, but there was like this group of 10 of us, and everybody, as just as soon as I saw this tiny bird, I didn't even know what it was when I took the picture because I couldn't see the detail at all, took the picture, and then everybody, like all the other um, you know, the people on my boat kind of descended on to the, the island and this, this little guy disappeared and I never saw another shorebird baby out there. Got home though and I was looking at my images and I did find out that this is a shorebird baby. It's a little bit older, but, um, but again, I didn't get a good picture because I just didn't have an opportunity. So that was the start. <laughs> and then uh, a couple, a year later, some of my friends saw mating um, black neck stilts, yeah, black neck stilts down in Florida in a location that I was going to be four weeks later. 
So I thought, oh, well, if they were mating, they probably have babies by the time I get out there. And I did find a, a young black neck still. A little bit older again, but it was really, it's, it's amazing. They're precocial, which means that they're fully, um, the, they're able to feed themselves immediately. They, they have the innate knowledge that they need to go um, hunt for food. It's, it's just really amazing to me. The same, it's uh, similar to uh, ducklings. But I was still unsatisfied because I had only just found a little bit older one. Um, I met some friends through Instagram, uh, Robin and Paul, Robin, Elman, Elman and Paul Steele. And she's the one who is, she raises, she's a monarch butterfly conservation in, in Queens, New York. And I've been doing a story on her. I've been photographing her as she raises her, her um, monarchs. But in light of new research published in mid 2019, she raises them all outdoors. Um, she goes goes to sites in the city where they mow frequently to rescue eggs, um, and then and then she, you know, grows them in her backyard habitat. She's hoping though they're, that they're going to list the monarchs as endangered later this year, so that she won't have to ha put so much effort into into helping the species. But anyway, this is just to say. They live in Long Island, and they told me about all the um, shorebirds and seabirds that nest along the coast of, of the barrier islands of Long Island. So I went out to visit them. Oh, so yes. So uh, here's, uh, here's Long Island, and here's the barrier islands down here. There's uh, Long Beach, Fire Island, um, and I, I can't remember what's further north. But specifically, Long Beach has this, uh, the magical land of Nickerson Beach, or Lido Beach, and Nickerson Beach is the uh, public area. And they have this, and I know that's a pretty cheesy graphic, but but it's it's to point out just the amazing, uh, the amazing, um, the birds that, uh, the protected nested areas in that and on that beach. So they've got they've got fencing, they've got fencing all around these areas, and they put out uh, decoys to lure the birds into the fencing area, because they naturally want to nest on this beach, but it's a very public beach. So we can have both worlds just by putting the fencing around and putting a decoy to lure them. All the all the species that nest here are fairly um, fairly uh, colonial nesters, some more than others, and I'm going to go through that in my slides. Anyhow, so on that beach, piping plovers, least terns, common terns, American oyster catchers, and black skimmers all nest in those protected areas. Um, the black skimmers, the common terns, and least terns are seabirds, and the piping plovers and American oyster catchers are shorebirds. And they're all like so unique in different ways. But I call them the big five nesting beach birds of coastal New York. And mostly um, I focus on Nickerson Beach, but my slides are from, my images are kind of from all over that area and the, the Atlantic coast. But you can actually find these five uh, nesting on Nickerson Beach. So I'm going to start with the American oyster catcher, which is a large shorebird. Uh, and they're called oyster catchers because they have this very thick, strong bill and they, they can break open oysters and find the meat inside. Uh, the conservation status uh, for internationally is least concern. Uh, but New York State, they have a great conservation concern, and, and there's a whole American oyster catcher project. And it's actually kind of rare to find them not banded as adults. So this is one that wasn't banded. But you'll see in a lot of my images, there are bands, even on the babies. 
they're very gregarious. They're, they're always spending time in flocks, large groups. And you can see them in their namesake behavior of just pulling meat out of this sh shell. And again, you, know, you can see the heavy banding. So if you do see one um, with the band, you can, you can report it. And uh, I don't have the link to the, I don't have the, the address here, but you can report it and then uh, find out information about its life. Um, I don't think it's this one, but one of the ones was already 19 years old, old, and it was interesting to see that it goes south down to Georgia and then it comes back every year. And sometimes they come back to the same mate, even though they don't migrate together, they actually will still come back to the same location and then pair up with the same mate. And they forage too. They can, uh, they, they can also eat insects and, and other, other uh, marine invertebrates. And this one is, it's interesting, it only has the one little band, so I don't know what that means. They are ground nesters. All of these birds are ground nesters. They just uh, clean out a little scrape on the ground and, and nest. Um, these are the earliest nesters of the five, I believe. Um, usually by the time I get out there, they've already got babies. And, and all, of the, all of these species have very similar eggs. They're, they blend in extremely well in their environment, as you can see. These are oyster catcher eggs. And they brood with the babies underneath them. This one looks like it has some extra legs because it's got its babies underneath. It's uh, chicks. Oyster, and there's the uh, a few days old uh, American oyster catcher. Uh, they're actually, although they are precocial, um, they're not on the high end of the precocial spectrum, and as babies, they actually have to be fed or taught to taught to feed by the adults. And I think it's because of the the unique the the way that they have to uh, break open the the shells and hunt for the meat. So just a little cute little oyster catcher baby. So yes, this is a this is actually my shorebird baby, but. Um, I think the piping plovers are way cuter. <laughs> so you can see her feeding an insect to the baby. And in this case, um, when there is more than one, there's always going to be a rivalry. So they're both going after the food. And one of them didn't get the, the, the one is chasing the other. The, the one that got the food is, is running away. So a little battle <laughs> ensued. <laughs> And when you're when you're watching this, um, you know I'm I'm probably at two a thousand millimeters on my lens here, and you can barely see what activity is going so you, it, going on. So you actually have to go back and review the images to really learn what's happened. And this is an older oyster catcher um, chick, and they like to hide behind things. They'll run. They'll they'll see you and they'll be interested in you and they'll run toward you, but then they'll hide real quick. And so they're hiding behind a child's toy here. But then they'll run more toward you again, just hiding in the sand. And here, this one's hiding behind uh, uh, seagrass or uh, beach grass. And this one's uh, brooding her chicks, and I think, no, that's not the video yet. And here you can see them again feeding. This is the one I think that was 19 years old. And I think came from Georgia, or sorry, travels down to Georgia during the summer, or during the winter months. And they're, they're, uh, very sturdy because this was an extremely windy day when they're out there. It can get, the can get, conditions can get really rough on the shore. They have the hurricanes coming through a lot during the summertime. And here's just a little, a little behavior. <laughs>
So piping plover, this is the most endangered of the species. Um, federal, even federally, they're threatened and the New York uh, Department of Environmental, I can't even think of what the C is right now. <laughs> the New York DEC has them as endangered. Um, they have a volunteer group that uh, keeps a census annually. They do not tend to ban them unless there's a reason to do so. But they very closely monitor these breeding colonies. Um, they forage for small worms or insects or tiny invertebrates. And this isn't a very good picture, but it's just to show you the, the breeding pair together. They don't actually spend a lot of time together, they, except maybe during courtship, but they're, again, they're early nesters, so usually they have the babies in June. Uh, oyster catchers can have the babies as early as in May, the chicks. But uh, this, uh, she's, she's actually encased in fencing. Um, whenever they lay their eggs, the volunteers come around and put a little cage around them to protect them because they are endangered. Again, they're ground nesters and their eggs, again, spotted, very similar, just blending in. And on this day, uh, the, the chicks had hatched that day. So these will be the youngest chicks that I've ever seen. Is they, they hatched that morning and we came out and we were, we were sitting low outside the fencing area and they were way inside. And, but the mom came out to check us out just to see if we were gonna be a threat. She wanted to see if we would move from our position if she came close or, and um, we, st we stayed there and we stayed low. We, were not, we didn't wanna be threatening. And then she, just, I guess, decided we were safe, so she started bringing her babies out. So, if you've ever, if you ever see these, they're like cotton balls with legs. They are, they're like, literally the size of cotton balls, and it's like they sprouted legs, and they're just running around the beach, and they're just crazy. So I got to see my teeny tiny baby peeps, <laughs> and right away, I mean, they're feeding themselves. They are fully precocial. They don't need to be fed. The only thing they need from the adults is brooding and protection. So you'll see, we were laying low on the ground and we were not being a threat. We were just letting them run around. We weren't gonna approach them. But every once in a while, a fisherman would walk through. And when they would, the mom would, would hunk, uh, get down on the ground and kind of call to the babies. And then they would come and, and squeeze under her. And then uh, that same night, this one ran across the, across the, between me and the sun and just gave me this, um, I call this one kicking up diamonds. But this, this was the one day old. And then this one is a few days, uh, a couple weeks later, I came out and find a family with, uh, found a family with four day old. And it's just amazing to watch them, just how, how smart they are just from day one. And this one was running from the wake. So this is another thing that I really wanted to witness was I wanted to see the babies like foraging in the water. Um, the, the waves will come in and bring small invertebrates uh, along with them. And then when the waves pull back, the babies and the adults will go hunt for food and then they'll run away as the wake comes back in. And that's just, uh, that was my first piping plover baby that I ever saw a couple years ago. And just a, a little behavioral. It's really windy this day, so that's So I'm, I'm kind of running short on time, so I'm going to try not to go too fat, too slow through this. But uh, common terns, and this is the, uh, 
federally not listed as endangered uh, New York State, they're threatened. And all of these birds are suffering from human encroachment. We're taking over their beach areas. They also, um, fight, and, and partly because of that, they're fighting more and more with the large gulls, um, like the ring, ring-billed gulls and herring gulls especially. They're uh, fighting for territory and, and they'll take the, the, the eggs and but this is the most abundant turn in New York. Again, ground nesters. This is one thing that I saw of this species that I did not, most of this is my observation. Some of it is backed up with research as, I mean, I've also backed up most of it with research, but this thing, I, this I could never find anything about. But the common turn specifically, the male would always be like high on a, um, high on a perch while the female was nesting. She's nesting back here. And they would perch on signs or on posts. But I always saw this as a common turn specifically. I, the others, not so much. Uh, this one's cleaning the nest of a, a shell. And this is my way of showing you what their egg looks like, because that's my only egg picture. And the babies look pretty much like the eggs. <laughs> and adorable. The adults hunt in the water, so uh, they dive in and look for small fish or, uh, yeah, small fish. And they bring it back to feed the young. The young are more like oyster catchers in, uh, in that they need to be fed and taught to, to fish. Um, so this behavior, because they have to hunt on the water, that's just, that has to be a learned behavior. When they're babies, they don't have wings. Obviously, they can't hunt for themselves. So, um, they're very protective of their area. They, they're actually extremely scrappy. Um, so much so that when their young are first born, they, they can terrorize their young. Uh, and I, I don't know exactly what the cause of this behavior, but uh, a turn expert friend of mine said that uh, they don't imprint right away. So it's possible that she, this adult thinks that this baby isn't hers and she's chasing it away from the nest area. But this is actually their baby. And they're like, this was actually heartbreaking to watch. The little baby, uh, the chick after, after this little uh, incident, it took a long time. I thought the chick was dead, but it finally got up, up and then it ran back to the adult and then brooded under the adult. So it's, it's really, it's sad to see the behavior. And I don't know if it's magnified by the fact that we're pushing more and more into their territory and they're pushed closer together, or if that's just the way it's always been. But they are very gregarious and common terns especially will nest very close to other common terns. But you can see them brooding after this after this argument. In 2019, there was some sort of uh, black fly infestation or some disease that swept through the babies, so they lost a, a large number of common terns. Uh, this is one of the few that that made it through. One of the few chicks that made it. Black skimmers fascinating birds. Um, they are actually also surveyed as part of the piping plover program. Uh, they're a uh, special concern by New York State and federally they're stable. And they have massive beaks. They, uh, they hunt by skimming the water and they drop their beak down to grab grab fish or other, yeah, just small fish, and then they uh, bring it back or, so this can show you, this isn't a great photo, but you can see the skim line behind the skimmer. But they're extremely gregarious as well, and they're always together. And you'll see them, this is in, uh, this is in the autumn as they're flocking up to fly south. But another look at the really large beak. But if you see it face on, 
you realize just how narrow it is, incredibly narrow. So it's very surprising when you see the difference between the two. Again, skimming. And they're always they're always together. So when one when one takes off from the area from wherever they are, they all fly together and they come and go together. And this is just showing you a group of them and you can see the photographers behind them. So they'll hang out on the beach in front of the protected area. But when they're when they're nesting, they're all within the the protected area. So these are photographers outside the fencing. And they're always together. I mean, it's it's really hard to get separation. So there's I was trying to I was trying to get a photo of them mating, which I do have. But uh, you see this one blocking the two. So you'll you'll start getting a good picture, and then another one will run right in front of them. That's just the hazards of photographing skimmers. But this pair, like there's different mating act uh, mating behavior for each species, and this pair. Uh, swiped their beaks together, then she turned around, ducked down, and he would climb on, and they would mate, and then he would fly off, and then uh, they touch their beaks together again. They, the pair always stay together. Uh, this one is, she's nesting right now, and he's hanging out. Um, the female is actually a little bit smaller than the male. This is their eggs. And the babies. Yeah, here you can really see the size difference between the male and the female. And the babies are just adorable, learning to use their wings. Much like the common the common terns, they have to be fed when they're young because they because they have to learn to skim. And one of the sequences I still don't have is I'd like to I'd like to watch the adults teaching the young how to skim. I liked this one because he got, he was flapping his wings and he even got some lift off. <laughs> but this, this right here, this little sequence illustrates just, they're already, they're already in this uh, horizontal position, even, even as young. So as they mature, they continue to sit like this. And this was just to illustrate, just because there's always other skimmers in the background. So this is more natural than when you see the babies without anything behind them. And their dad is hunting and bringing back food for the young, but even, even as, as they mature, because this one doesn't have a big enough bill to, to hunt for itself yet. And here's just a little quick clip. <laughs> So, uh, it's, it's eight o'clock and I don't know, all I have, I have real quick the turns. And what I can do is jump to the end video. If you, it's a three-minute video. If you prefer, I can do that. Or you're muted, Chrissy. Sure, that'd be fine. Okay. So turns are. I have the least information about turns, anyhow. Least turns. Um, and you'll see this in the video. So I'm just going to go on to the video. But they're pre they're uh, they're much like the common terns, but they don't spend nearly as much time in large groups. Or I mean, sorry, they don't they don't spend their time in large groups. But this is just a little three minute uh, clip just to show you. Just this was just one day um, on the beach in in 2019. It was or 2018 rather um, in I think mid June. So this is just all the activity of of one. Uh, that day.
that's the end of that's the end of that. <laughs> are there uh, the are there any uh, there was no, are there any other questions uh, about this presentation or the other one? I had a question about the uh, the birds that were facing outward from the back of the. Uh, oh I, yeah, I, the the least turns. Yeah, is that a typical position for birds to be um, brooding under their under the the adult? Because I always picture them facing forward, but maybe it would be better if they were facing backward. I um so. Yeah, what, what happens is they just, they push through, they push under, and she, the least turns are so small that, you know, you just see them out the other side, really. But it also gives them visibility. So I, I, why they choose that position, I'm not, I'm not really sure. It's just, but they push through from the front. Oh. So that's just how they come through. I think it's completely adorable, though. I mean, to watch all the different brooding techniques with all the different species. There's, I could go on for hours, but I would bore you to tears. But <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Terry, we have um, some questions and a comment or two oh, in I uh, the chat box. Uh, first, uh, I'll, I'll read them to you. Steve Kinney um, did a quick Google search on the big Corn eye gland and found it's called the preorbital gl gland and it's found in many hoofed animals and is homologous to the tear glands in humans. They also produce secretions that contain pheromones and other chemicals and function as a scent gland to mark territory. There may also be some antimicrobial compounds that fight against skin pathogens. So thank you for that, Steve. Oh yeah, um, thank and then you Mary, very much. Mary asked, what is the difference between a seabird and a shorebird? That is their classification. Um, seabirds hunt in the water, like skimmers and the least turn. Like you saw that picture of the whole group of them going down into the water. Uh, like gulls are also classified as seabirds. Shorebirds hunt for their food on the shore. And uh, looking, uh, like you saw the images of them following the waves out and coming back in. So I think that that is the typical classification difference between the two. Okay, thank you. Um, Selma asks, can you recommend a software to organize photos? I use, uh, I use Adobe products for all, for all of it. For, um, I use Lightroom to organize photos. I, well, I organize them on my C drive or on my, um, I'm sorry, on my hard drives, but um, as by date and then I put a little name uh, kind of describing where they were taken or the biggest event of that day. But in Lightroom is where I where I do all my photo, my basic photo editing. And then I do a little bit of touch up in Photoshop. So I don't know if that answers your question. And then uh, I use Adobe Premiere Pro to edit video. So I use all their products. Yeah, I guess what I was um, hoping is some software, like if I want to find all the pictures I took on a given date versus, say, all the, you know, birds I took, you know, all the oyster catcher photos I have, you know, so you can find them. Yeah, you can do that with Lightroom. You can actually have tags stored in your Lightroom database. And then the beauty of Lightroom too is once you've added, you can always go back to the original photo. <coughs> Excuse me, you can see your editing sequence through the life cycle of the photo. But yeah, you can, um, so you use tags for each of the images. Like when you import your images into Lightroom, it's importing a thumbnail of the image. It's not actually importing the image. And it keeps track of all the images and it, as you're importing, if you put a tag, then you can you can tag like a location for all of the species or all of the everything from that day. But you can also go back and individually tag, you know, to highlight a specific behavior or something that you witnessed. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Hey. I have a question. Uh, what's your next project, Carrie? What's your next passion? You're gonna. 
Oh, well, um, I've been, I've been documenting this, uh, this woman on the coast, my friend Robin, uh, and her monarch. Uh, so I'm doing a, a photo story about her specifically, but I'm also doing kind of a more of a larger project, just documenting uh, kind of the heroes of, of monarchs, the people that are do, creating habitat for them or uh, or trying to raise them. You know, there's there's very important, it's very important when you do raise monarchs not to not to raise them indoors, at least based on recent studies. Um, just, uh, just documenting monarchs. <laughs> and I also, my biggest, my biggest challenge right now, again, is my backyard ecosystem. Just trying to, I'm hoping to kind of, kind of educate my neighbors a little bit, I guess, on how important it is to maybe keep a little bit of their yards wild, just because we're encroaching so much on, on and, and that got started because um, I put a trail camera in my backyard. Like I bought, I bought the upper half acre after this. So I, I just have my normal backyard, which is really short. And I put a trail camera out and like right away, I discovered that um, fox kits were coming down into my backyard to play at three in the morning. And right then I knew that I needed the, the half acre above me, I needed to make sure that nobody ever built there. So I bought it and now, like I said, I'm fighting with one of my neighbors because she thinks I should be mowing the whole thing because it doesn't look pretty. She'd rather, she'd like to be able to dump on my property. Like they, she used to put yard waste out there, but we have, I mean, we can put stuff on our curb. It's, it's not that big of a deal. In fact, it's actually further for her to walk across the street and dump in my yard. So I don't get it, but whatever. <laughs> but any, um, any, and that's pretty much it right now. I mean, there's always some new adventures to have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Terry. That was wonderful. Your uh, photographs and your, your videos are just beautiful and you have a lot of patience <laughs> to spend so much Oh, yeah. <laughs> It looks like it's very rewarding. It has a lot of big payback. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And um, thank you to everybody who participated tonight. It was great to see everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Terry. Good night.